Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're having tech problems. Keep that in your prayers. That can be your best friend and the most frustrating thing ever. Amen? Some of you know what I'm talking about. All right. Today, I've actually, let's see if we can get this working. Hmm. Let me make sure the receiver on that is in. Clicker. Okay. We're going to roll with this today, so bear with me. I've titled today's message, An Unexpected King for an Unprepared Generation. Uh, when you look at the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16 specifically, there's something that in most of you have probably read it several times. I've probably read it hundreds upon hundreds of times. But there's always, you have that moment where all of a sudden you read it and the Holy Spirit stops you in your tracks and all of a sudden you feel the weight of it. You bear the weight of actually what's being said. Well, that was the case for me not so long ago. Reading Matthew 16, the Pharisees and Sadducees, they come to Yeshua and they say, show us a sign. And his response is, hypocrites, hypocrites. You can discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of of the times. And that hit me really hard. Yeshua's response was to them, you are deaf and blind. You are the walking dead. You do not know what time it is. Given that reality, given how Yeshua responded to them, I I think it's critically important for us to ask the question, are we prepared? Do we know what time it is? Where we are at? Or are we completely blind? Because if we're the latter, we're as good as dead. So this is, this is critical. This is vital information. I want to open up today by taking you to 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. Little children, it is the last hour. John knows what time it is. And he tells the little children, it is the last hour. Now, you really want to appreciate this statement Dig into the historical context. Look at it in the historical context. you got to go back to the first century. John made this statement in the first century, told them over 1,900 years ago, it's the last hour. If that's the case, then I ask you, what time is it today? What time is it today? And I will argue. And as we get through this further and further, I think you will see this to be true. It is the last minute of the last hour. We are at the end of the end of the age. That is where we are at. The return of the Messiah is imminent. He is at the door. It is imminent. And see, that's one of the things that John is doing here. Notice when he says, little children, it's the last hour. He's not just simply coming out. I'm I'm telling you this because I know what time it is. He's telling them this because there's urgency. There was urgency in the message. Creating panic. A good panic. A panic where you prepare, you get your house in order. You know, I could remember as a young child, and again, most of you know, my parents got saved in the Jesus People movement, and there was revival in the 60s and 70s that swept this country and actually all over the world. There was a mass revival. People were coming to faith in Yeshua by the droves. Thousands were waiting in line to get into these tents and into these church uh, services. They weren't happening for an hour. They weren't even happening for two hours. Some of these services were 8, 10, 12 hours long. The people were hungry for it. And do you know there was a particular narrative that exists, that existed back then? There was a narrative that, that put me back on my heels as a young man to where all I could think about, there was one thing I could think about all day long. I saw it on T-shirts, I saw it on this written on, on signs, on billboards. I saw people holding up homemade signs of it. I heard preachers preaching it week after week after week. And what was it? It was Jesus is coming soon. That was the message. The me- that's all I could hear in the groups, in the Bible studies, my parents, what they talked about. No, Jesus is coming soon. And it was so powerful. It was so weighty. Every day of my life, there was a period 
of my life for several years, there wasn't a day that went by that I was not considering this could be the day. I was living in the moment. I was living in the moment of his return. This was real to me. The message that was being preached was urgent. There was a stir of panic, and rightfully so. We have a, a real reason to panic today. Yeshua is coming soon. One of the scary things is, is as I grew up in, you know, in the 70s, in, in hearing this, this narrative, that that's all you heard, that's all these, everybody's talking about, Jesus is coming soon. I don't see that same urgency or panic today in the church. And that is frightening. Going to 1 Peter 4, 7. Okay, this is what it says. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. See, Peter knew what John knew. And Peter's creating this urgency. He's creating panic and telling his audience, listen, the end of everything is at hand. It's right before us. You better get serious and you better be watchful. And you look in the Greek and that actually means sober. You're not given to illusion. You're not going to fall into that trap. You're going to have perfect clarity of mind. You're going to know exactly what's going on. Going to Ezekiel 30, verse 2, Son of man, prophesy and say, Thus says Adonai Yehovah, Wail, wail, woe to the day, for the day is near. Even the day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of clouds, the time of the Gentiles. And we'll get into that time of the Gentiles into next week. We're going to carry this message into next week. But here, Ezekiel, the... The Lord put his, the Holy Spirit literally moved, put words into his mouth, and this was this message that he was to bring to the people of God. He was a true prophet of God. He was a watchman. And as a watchman, what did he, what did he, what did he bring to the forefront? The reality. There's urgency. You should be panicking. The Lord is on his way. Isaiah 13. Wail, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Therefore, all hands will be limp. Every man's heart will melt, and they will be afraid. Pains and sorrows will take hold of them. They will be in pain as a woman in childbirth. They will be amazed at one another. Their faces will be as flames. Continuing on. Behold, he nay. This will mean more in a second. He nay. Behold, the day of the Lord comes. Cruel with both wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate, and he will destroy its sinners from it. See, here's the reality. Isaiah is causing panic here, saying the Lord is coming, and he is bringing hell. Hell is coming with him. We're told in Isaiah he is literally clothing himself in garments of vengeance. There is a cause for panic. There is a real cause for urgency and the message that he is coming soon. And here's the thing that Isaiah is conveying. There's nothing anyone can do about it. Nobody can stop what is coming. This is terrifying. You think you know pain. You think you know sorrow. You think you know fear. In this life, you have no idea. You have no idea what is coming. What you've experienced in this life, if you were to take every single individual and put all their fears together, will pale in comparison to when the Messiah issue is revealed from heaven and his pure, infinite holiness. There will be terror that sweeps across the land. Every hand will hang limp. They will be frozen. Revelation 22, 12, Yeshua, saying the exact same thing that we read in Isaiah 39. Behold, and that's Edu in the Greek, that is the Hebrew equivalent of Hine. Behold, I am coming quickly. He doesn't say, take your time. I'm going to take my time coming back. I'm going to say, No. I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. This gets into the situation. Do you believe it? Do you actually believe that this is true? And all you need to do is start taking a personal audit of what are you meditating on? Are, are you meditating on I want you to think about what you've been meditating on the last couple days. I want you to think about what you're going to be as you go in the next, the next couple days. In the first, be mindful. What are you thinking? What are your thoughts? Are you concerned about all these things in the world? Are you concerned about building your kingdom here? All the things that you got to do here. 
How much time do you spend in the Word, hearing from God, taking His counsel? How much time do you really spend in prayer? Do you spend more time in front of the TV, taking the counsel of the world, with its witchcraft, with its idolatry, with its immorality, than you do in prayer? I got to tell you something. When you start to do this audit, when you start to see how much time you've invested in all these cares and concerns of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and pride of life. I'm going to tell you right now, there is no way you could convince me that you believe this. No way you could convince me. Because if you really believed it, you would be immersing yourself in the word. You would be immersing yourself in prayer. You would be praying and fasting. There would be an urgency in spreading the gospel. There would be an urgency to receive it pure urgency. And there is such a refining process that happens when someone actually feels, as I did as a young man, feeling the weight of the reality. I actually believed he was coming. The purification process that happens to us is amazing. The clarity that you get of mind, the Holy Spirit showing you things, you're being able to see the wickedness of the world. You want nothing to do with it. All the deceptions that it has to offer, all that that's tantalizing, it's anathema to you. You hate it. Why? Because you know he's about to be revealed. And all you can think about, all you're concerned about when he's revealed, what will I be? Who will I be? How will he? I mean, will I be a sheep? Will I be a goat? This should be consuming us. Apostle Paul in Romans 13. And do this. Knowing the time. We are to know the time. We're not to be ignorant of these things. Like the Pharisees and Sadducees that Yeshua rebuked, he called them hypocrites. Knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. Oh, the day is at hand. It's here. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Get righteous. Get right with Yeshua. Get in relationship with him. Stop chasing the nonsense in the world. It will lead you to your destruction. We do not have time to do that. We don't have time to build our kingdom here. You know, Paul says to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians at the end of chapter 4, we don't seek the things which are seen, but we're to seek the things which are unseen. For the things which are seen, they're temporary. The things which are unseen are eternal. The things which your eyes don't see. I'm going to tell you right now, you better have your eyes fixed on the Lord. You better have your eyes fixed in his word so that you can see and so that you can hear. Because if you're living your life horizontally all the way around you and you're just looking at it, I mean, and, 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 and all these things that the internet is throwing in front of you that just captivate you, whether it's whatever it is, read all these desires of your fleshly heart. It could be immorality. You're just soaking it in through the lamp of your body. Soaking it in. It will destroy you. We've got to shed this stuff. We've got to seek ye first the kingdom of God. James, and notice, I'm intentionally, I'm jumping all over. I looked at Isaiah. I looked at Ezekiel. We looked at Yeshua. We're looking at Paul. We looked at Peter. Now I'm going to show you James. You also be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. James comes with urgency. There is panic. There is a cause for panic. He is at the door. I mean, you look at all of these righteous men in this book that I revere. They're all saying the same thing, and they're all moving with the same panic. They're freaking out. And they're trying to convey the reality to us. But see, if you're looking at the world, you, you're not going to listen. You become complacent. And they say curiosity killed the cat. Complacency will kill the church. Guarantee it. It is time to panic. It is time to change. It is time to prepare. Psalm 95, one of my favorite psalms, and you'll understand why. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. The first thing you need to recognize, there is a calling. The Lord is calling you to him. Come and worship me. You think of Yeshua when he came on the scene, he said, 
Come to me, all you who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. There was a call to come and worship him, follow him. This is the gospel. What is being preached in Psalm 95 is absolutely the gospel. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is Elohim, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hands. Today, if you will hear his voice, not tomorrow, not sometime in the future, you know, when it, you know, when it's convenient for you, I don't want to mess with your worldly schedule. Well, then go ahead. You, you can hear his voice later on. He said today, this is a Joshua 24 moment. Choose you this day, today, whom you will serve. You cannot wait. There's, with the pure gospel, the truth of the gospel, when it is preached with Holy Spirit power, there is urgency. You can't preach it with enough urgency. There is panic. There is no tomorrow when the gospel is preaching in truth, when it's being moved in truth. You don't think about tomorrow. And I can't tell you, and I'm, I'm not making this up, and it's terrifying to listen to people's testimony out of their own mouths with saying, you know what, Daniel? I know what I'm doing isn't, I know I shouldn't even be doing it. And I continue to do it, and I, I'm just thankful that the grace of God is upon me. And at some point, and I have literally heard people say this, I'm not making it up. At some point, I know I'm going to come back to the Lord, and I'll repent. No, you won't. You've decided today who you would serve. You will not. You cannot. This concept, and it drives me crazy to listen to people use the thief on the cross as the precedent. Well, when I get put up on the cross and I'm about to die, that's when I'm going to turn back to the Lord. No, you won't. You've already chosen. Listen to what the psalmist says. Listen. It's today if you will hear his voice. Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness. In rebellion, in other words, you do not accept him today. You are following the same example Israel did. They didn't listen to him. They rejected him. They walked in rebellion. How'd that work for them? When they wanted, when they repented, they wanted to go up into the land. The Lord said, you will not go. And what did they do? They went anyway. It is not going to work. There has to be, when we're preaching the gospel and if we're going to hold the name of Yeshua in our hands, it has to be with urgency. There's no time left. We need to wake up and know what time it is. Going back to 1 John, I didn't finish the passage, so we're going to go back here. There's a lot here. Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard, oh, as you have heard, the Antichrist, look at this, the Antichrist is coming. There is a central figure, a figure in the singular, known as Antichristos. The Antichrist, what it means in the Greek literally means the opponent of Christ, the adversary of Christ. There is a specific individual that is going to come on the scene and understand something. According to Scripture, according to the prophets, this individual will exist at the coming of the Messiah. More than that, right before the coming of the Messiah, this Antichrist is revealed to the world. They're going to see him. For who he is. This is what the prophets say, and I didn't, we're not going to get into that, and I could certainly go down that road. But this is what they say. It's very important. Now, he's not done. Okay, so here John says we're in the last hour. He's recognizing within this last hour of time, the Antichrist will come. He's recognizing it. But then he goes on and says this. Even now, many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. I want you to think about that statement for a second. Many antichrists, this is how we know. John's determination of looking and understanding what the signs of the times are, one of those signs, one of those pieces of evidence to support his statement that we're in the last hour was he looked out on the landscape and there were antichrists running amok. Many antichrists, he says. Many, I'll highlight this by which we know that it is the last hour. By which we know it is the last hour. And I thought I highlighted, there we go. Okay, we're working. I want to draw your attention to this. This this many antichrists. There's something here that it, it was helpful for me, and I think it might be helpful for you to give you perspective in regard to where John is coming from, how John uses this term, antichrist, uh, in here is antichristoi in, in, in the plural. He actually utilizes this 
synonymously with false prophets. So when there's all these antichrists, as he calls them, they are the false prophets. And that really puts that into perspective for you. And let me just help prove this to you by taking you to 1 John. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. Because, why? Many false prophets have gone out into the world. And that's the very same Greek construction of poloi, many. So here he's talking about these many antichrists have, have come. And here, and as he gets to chapter 4, he warns of the false prophets. He's using these interchangeably. That's very important to know. And proof of this, further proof of this, is all we need to do. We need to go back and finish this statement, putting up verse 19. They went out from us. Now, I want you to think about that statement for a second. They went out from us. He's looking at the landscape. He just declared there are many antichrists, many false prophets. The most scary thing comes to the table. They came from us. They came out of our camp. I, think about this. The most powerful church, the first century church, that boasted the, the, the apostles, the apostles of the Messiah who saw his resurrected form. They were the first church. They were anointed and dude with power on high. We follow what we follow because of what they have taught. So think about this. The most powerful church out of this most powerful first century church were streaming antichrist. Think about that deception for a second. And you know, just as a side note, because we're coming off of Galatians, the statement they went out from us, exact same Greek construction that you would find in Acts 15. It's interesting. Exact same construction. Remember when the apostles wrote in Acts 15 regarding the Gentiles, they actually wrote a letter and they, heard, and they actually said, and we have heard, some went out from us, exact same Greek construction, and have troubled you and unsettled your soul with words to whom we gave no such command. See, now, when you understand that these men went out in teaching, it's, you know what, you got to be circumcised, uh, even though you have the circumcision of Christ upon you. you no, know, you still need to do this. You need to understand what was really being said when they said they went out from us. Antichrists have left our camp. They've gone forth. And so this just gives you perspective. False prophets go forth. You need to feel the weight of that reality. Because what I'm telling you is if the Antichrist were pouring out of the first century church, how much more today? And this is exactly the point Paul makes. But evil men and imposters, imposters, false prophets, false teachers, Antichrist, will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Paul in the first century said, guess what? It's not going to get better. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. And I'm going to tell you, it only increases until we get to the day of judgment. Evil is growing. Deception is growing. It is a cancer. 2 Timothy 4.3, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, oh, they will heap up for themselves teachers. Teachers, and these would be the antichrists. These would be the false teachers, the false prophets. They will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Again, he says to Timothy in his first letter, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, and they're working through antichrists. They're working through false prophets. 2 Peter 2.1 but there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. They will bring in doctrines into the church. They're going to bring doctrines that are going to lead you to your death. Again, look at the church today. You know what's frightening to me? Everything these men have spoken is being fulfilled right before our eyes. To the T. Antichrists have been let loose. They're leading people to the death. They're promising them life. They're promising them liberty. And the people love them for it. We live in scary times. Do we know what time it is? I want to take you to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This is what we read. The mystery, the secret power, the secret power of lawlessness, toilessness, is already at work. That was in the last hour. 
We're at the last minute of the last hour. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way, verse 8. And then, what? The lawless one, anamos in the Greek. Now, this is important to point out. John calls him the antichristos, okay? Paul calls him the animos. It's the same person we're talking about, okay? The antichrist. Paul is explicitly bringing the antichrist to the forefront, called the lawless one here in the English. He will be revealed. See, that's very important, and that's one of the reasons you, we have 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It's because people were running around saying, all oh, his coming's already happened, and Paul's saying, stop it. It hasn't. Yeshua hasn't come because the lawless one hasn't been revealed. Paul knew the signs of the times. He was educated. He was anointed. He had eyes to see and ears to hear, and he knew what had to happen first. So the anti, so the lawless one will be revealed to him. The Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. In other words, this antichrist, the antichrist, not this, not this you know, false prophets, false teachers that are going out, but the antichrist is going to be the very embodiment of Hasatan. I want you to think about something, which is a picture. But when Yeshua was being betrayed, Judas leaves. In John 13, we are told that Satan entered Judas. Literally entered Judas. Now, Judas is a great example of an antichrist, of the antichrist. And what happened? The devil entered him, and he went to make war against Yeshua. It was a great battle. It's going to happen again. It's going to happen again. He is going to inhabit. The devil is going to come. He's going to inhabit the lawless one. It's going to be according to his power, his signs, his wonders. The only difference is instead of Yeshua going to the cross, he's going to destroy him. He will never again exist. Very, very different outcome. Moving on to verse 10. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish... Why? Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. So recognize there is a rejection of truth at the end. There's going to be this mass rejection of Torah, of the Torah made flesh. Mass rejection. Verse 11. And for this reason, oh, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. So get this, at the end, at the very end, there's going to be a mass rejection of Torah. There's going to be a mass rejection of truth, of the living Torah, of Yeshua. But something happens because of that. All of a sudden, delusion sets in. If we're at the end, what we should be seeing is mass psychosis, a complete detachment from reality. If we're at the end, we should see the masses, the masses of the world falling into complete delusion. Well, let me help you out with this for a second. It's amazing the conversations that you can have with people in regard to unborn children. That somehow, in their mind, they've been told and they believe the lie that the unborn child in a mother's womb is a blob of cells. One second later, no, oh, now it's a human being. Now we can give this human being its rights. One second later, after being born, blob of cells, Second before, now all of a sudden, now it's human right. I call that delusion. I call that mass psychosis, totally detached from reality. You think of this transgender issue that is going on, and now we got special neut gender neutral pronouns that you've never heard before. We're making up this stuff. It is unbelievable. And men that are biologically men, if they want to be a woman, they're, I guess, now a woman, magically. And if someone doesn't want to be a man or woman, well, they're, 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 they don't have a sex. There's no biology. Then you got to use this general neutral uh, uh, pronoun. Delusion. It's mass delusion. This is what we were told to expect. I'm not kidding you. Okay, so not that long ago, I had a conversation, and I bring this up to show you, to really prove the point. Atheist. I had a conversation with an atheist, he, and I've talked to him about the Lord before, and he, he's just not interested, but he's a really nice guy, super sweet guy, and actually give you the shirt off his back, very caring, and in and, and, and that standpoint, amazing. But I was just walking out, I ran into him, and I said, oh, how you doing, buddy? 
He's like, oh, I'm doing great, and all that, 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 and we're done talking. So, so where are you working now? And I'm asking him. He's like, well, you wouldn't believe. This is an atheist. He said, Dan, you wouldn't believe what I'm doing. I'm having to build bathrooms for a particular retailer for confused people. <laughs> this, is, this is what an atheist told me. Now, he, believe me when I say this, he is not interested in God. He has no spiritual eyes to see, at least not yet. I pray for him. But this is what he said. When I have atheists, I walked away from there marveling. When I have atheists telling me they're going, these people are delusional. You are at the end. Mass delusion will exist at the very end. 2 Peter 3, 3. Knowing this first, that scoffers, scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. In other words, scoffer, another aspect that we need to identify that will be at the end of the end is that scoffers will rise up and say, oh, yeah, Jesus is coming soon. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. We've heard that before. And they, all of a sudden, the name of Yeshua becomes a mockery. And and then we, who believe Yeshua is coming soon, we're the delusional ones. You see how this works? This was all prophesied. We were told this is what was going to happen. Um, I'm going to jump ahead here. Picking it up in verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come, what? As a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. A warning gets sent to us. He is coming as a thief. See, he's, it's going to be an unexpected king for an unprepared generation. This is the generation you should be looking for for the return of the king. The one that where he will come back as a thief. The apostle Paul in 2 Thessalonians 5.1 but concerning the times and seasons, brethren, he's dealing with time. Brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly, oh, that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. And then he goes on and says this, for when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. Another thing you must be looking for at the end of the end, right before the coming of the Lord, the people will be crying out peace and safety. Interesting fact, at the end of World War II, there was an organization that was put together by what we now call the UN, the United Nations. And it has some very specific directives, one of which is peace and safety. I took this right off their website. I want you to see this. This is what they do. They maintain international peace and security, peace and safety. The UN Security Council has the primary responsibility for international peace and safety, peace and security. This is one of their primary objectives. The very thing that we're told that the people would be saying right before the coming of the Messiah. Let me take this a step further. Do you know when... The UN was established. October. There you go. <laughs> he has better eyes than I do. Not October of 45, October 24th, 1945. Why is that significant? Well, when you take it to the Jewish calendar, it becomes very, very significant. It's the 17th of Heshvan. What happened on the 17th of Heshvan? That was the first day the Lord opened judgment in the days of Noah. It was the initiation of judgment. Now, if you think that this is a coincidence, that this is the very day the UN was put together and they go out proclaiming their primary, one of their primary directives to offer peace and safety, you are kidding me. There's something else about the UN that is bigger than all of what I just showed you. The most significant component of it. What does the UN do? What's the purpose of the UN? I mean, primarily their overview purpose is to draw all nations together. That's hence the name, United Nations. 
Let me take you to a prophecy. In Joel chapter 3, if I can get the clicker. Can we move to Joel 3? Thank you. For behold, in those days and at that time, and we can highlight, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, start recognizing the times. Oh, what happened around the time? This is amazing. So it, it all happened almost simultaneously, so close together. You had the construction of the UN. Just after that, what happened? All of a sudden, Israel, the Jewish people, are brought back home. They're given an independent state in 1948. The Jewish, but this was prophesied. The Lord would bring them home at the end of the age. This is at the very, very end. But what is said next? And I will gather all nations. Now think about this. So with the bringing back of Israel, that's not all he's going to do. He's going to unite the nations together. He's going to bring them all together, bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage, Israel. Isn't that interesting? The very day the UN was created is the very day God began to pour out judgment on the rebellious. Whom they have scattered among the nations. Oh, and look at this. They have divided up my land. I challenge you, just go onto the UN website or type into Google and look at the Palestine partition plan. Look up Resolution 181. Who is at the helm of that? It was the United Nations. They have divided up my land. The nations have come together to divide the land of Israel. You tell me what days we're living in. You tell me what time it is. We are at the very end of the end. It is frightening. I want to take you to Genesis 11, and we're going to end on this story in Genesis 11. Because you know, and you've been with me long enough, all the stories in Scripture, they're prophetic representations. There's prophecy embedded with them. Maaseh, Vot, Simon, Lebanim. The deeds of the Father, the signs for the children. It's prophecy. And this ties in with the UN. This ties in with what's going on right now. Genesis 11, 1. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. They all have come together. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had a brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. Verse 4. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city whose tower, whose top, a tower whose top is in the heavens. And this is an interesting, this is the Tower of Babel story. Okay? Highly prophetic of the very end. And what they got to do, they all got together, hey, we're going to build something so grand, so exceptional. But here's the thing. Only a couple hundred years earlier, what event took place? The flood. The flood took place. What is this, what is the response to God's judgment on the earth? By the nations. Now, keep in mind, all the nations had come together. The response is to build a great city, an elevated city, whose tower is going to reach the heavens. You, you need to think about this, so that the next time the Lord would bring judgment, they will not face it. They will not be subjected to God's judgment. The whole act of what is happening here is pure rebellion. This is being independent, broken off from God. We want nothing to do with him. Let me further prove this to you in a little bit of commentary from Josephus. And it's on this very story. Now, it was Nimrod. Nimrod. And, and I'm going to tell you something. Nimrod is an antichrist. He is a picture of antichrist. Nimrod, who excited them to such an affront and contempt of God. I'm going to tell you, this is what the antichrist, the antichrist, and the spirit of antichrist, moving in the antichrist, does. Such an affront and contempt of God. They would give, they'll have a contempt for his law. They'll have a contempt for who he is, his righteousness. This Nimrod was the grandson of Ham, which we know is the wicked son of Noah. The son of Noah, a bold man. One of the characteristics of the Antichrist that you can absolutely look for is he is fearless. Antiochus Epiphanes is a perfect example. He was an Antichrist, a perfect picture of the final Antichrist. Going in, laughing and giggling, psychotically defiling the holy temple of God, like as though he's drunk. 
And this is the same spirit, this same boldness that we see in Nimrod. And he had a great strength of hand, and he persuaded them not, not to ascribe it to God. The work that you perform, do not give it to the Lord. Don't give it to him. As if it was through his means they were made happy. God has done nothing for you. But to believe that it was their own courage which procured that happiness. I mean, we're living in a generation of this, of self, self-glorification, self-gratification. Moving on. He also uh, gradually changed the government into tyranny. <laughs> you cannot make that stuff up. I just challenge you to start looking around the globe and what's happening. That word actually is being used over and over and over again in multiple governments. Tyranny. It's because the spirit of Antichrist is moving. It is here. Seeing no other way of turning men from the fear of God, but to bring them into constant dependence on his power. And he also said he would be revenged on God if he should have a mind to drown the world again. Now look at this. For that he would build a tower too high for the waters to be able to reach, and that he would avenge himself on God for destroying their forefathers. Amazing commentary recognizing the rebellion of what is actually happening at the Tower of Babel and the purpose of its construction. Genesis 11, 4. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves. Oh, what's it say? Lest, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Isn't that interesting? Lest we be scattered. Now, we need to stop because it's the same Hebrew word that you see used of Israel. See, when Israel sinned against God, what did he do as punishment? Scattered. What are they refusing to accept? The judgment of God. You know, when the gospel is going out in this age and, and, and people are looking at you when they stand with this PC agenda and they're foaming at the mouth with hatred towards you, understand this is the situation. They do not, will not be subject to the judgment of God. They are not going to come under his authority. It's frightening. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. Moving on. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one. United nations. They have come together as one. And for the same efforts, and they have all one language. And it's interesting that you notice that we're living in the first time in, in, in the history of the world since the Tower of Babel. The language barriers are broken down. Language barriers are broken down. We have interpreters. We have most people speak English today. They're coming back to one language. You can't make this stuff up, people. And they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down. And there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Look at what's going on here. They have come together as one man. For one cause, they refuse to come under the judgment of God. And what is the next thing we read? That's what prompts the coming of the Messiah. That's what, comes, that's what brings the Lord down. To do what? He scattered them to bring judgment. It's the very thing. So when we start looking at the UN and things of that nature, you, you need to open your eyes up on what's going on and understand how close we are to the end because we are there. We are at the very end. 